The program originally scheduled for this time will not be heard, but beginning tomorrow, Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, over many of these stations, the National Broadcasting Company inaugurates a new daily radio serial entitled Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney, written by Phillips H. Lord, is a timely radio series designed for entertainment and carrying throughout a theme close to the millions of Americans who are victims of crime. It is only through the interest and cooperation of the public that crime and rackets can be fought by your district attorney. Grand juries have been summoned in many of our big cities to fight corruption. Fearless prosecutors everywhere are trying to rid their cities, counties, and states of those who prey on our citizens. The serial Mr. District Attorney is realistic fiction based on facts. The dramas will depict the work being done in every district attorney's office. As a fitting preview to this show, the National Broadcasting Company this afternoon has invited leading district attorneys from many key cities of the nation to tell us about their work and how the public can cooperate and help them. And so for the first district attorney, we hear from Mr. Paul E. Lockwood, Executive Assistant District Attorney of New York County. Mr. Lockwood. Ever since the year 1664, rogues have been prosecuted in the Court of General Sessions in the County of New York. Someone has had to conduct the prosecution all these centuries. The job in modern times, at least, has been done by the District Attorney of New York County and his assistants. In early days, the New York prosecutor was a colonial barrister. He was called upon occasionally to come down to court and try some felon, who, if convicted, was hustled off to the gallows or the whipping post, while a barrister went back to his chambers or his coffee house. Though New York has grown since those carefree days, the old court is still doing business under the same name. But right across the street, the visitor will find the present-day prosecutor with his staff housed in 11 stories of two buildings, a veritable hive of criminal prosecution, humming day and night with activity. Crime in a great city has become as complex as life in it. No longer is the district attorney's job merely trying such pickpockets, fire bugs, highway robbers, horse thieves, and occasional cutthroats as the police bring in. He still must dispose of the same old crimes rising from avarice, lust, passion, and vengeance. But in addition, he must unravel such things as stock frauds, bucket shop deals, fake insurance claims, and forgeries. And most important of all, he must direct the attack on the vast structure of the organized underworld and racketeering. Today, one-tenth of the material wealth of the United States is concentrated on the island of Manhattan. Wall Street, Fifth Avenue, Park Avenue, the waterfront, Broadway, each of these attracts its quota of men and women with larcenous instincts. They all complicate the work of the district attorney. To cope with this new structure of crime, Mr. Dewey works not only with the 80 lawyers who are his full-time assistants, but he calls upon the scientist in his laboratory to decipher erasures on the ledger page, the psychiatrist to peer into the cloudy mind of the mentally ill witness, the accountant to spell out from the records of great corporations evidence of fraud and deceit, the skilled investigator to go undercover and bring back to him essential information. He weaves the evidence obtained from all these sources into a pattern for his courtroom case against the criminal. For every hour he spends before the court and jury, scores of hours of investigation and preparation have been expended in the office. The average citizen has little contact with the district attorney's office. He has no occasion to know of the battles that are being fought there daily against the forces that would oppress the community. It is of major importance that the public be made aware of the workings of the district attorney's office to achieve a new degree of cooperation, without which we cannot win in the constant fight against crime and the underworld. Thank you, Mr. Paul Lockwood of the District Attorney's Office in New York. And now the voice you will hear next comes to you from Washington, D.C. The speaker will be Wellie K. Hopkins, Chief of the Criminal Trial Division of the Federal Department of Justice. The Department of Justice welcomes the opportunity to join in this program and expresses its appreciation to the National Broadcasting Company. 
The story of the prosecutor, the story of Mr. District Attorney is a fascinating one. The federal government alone has 94 district attorneys ever vigilant in investigating, prosecuting, and suppressing crime. Approximately 50,000 criminal cases a year are handled by these men, including such federal violations as embezzlement, frauds, bank robberies, kidnapping, criminal conspiracies, racketeering, and so on, almost ad infinitum. Their manifold duties are supervised by the Department of Justice under the able leadership of Honorable Frank Murphy, Attorney General of the United States. Like state district attorneys, these federal officers wield tremendous influence for good, a power not often recognized. Contemplate for a moment the handling of a criminal case. The district attorney receives a complaint. He decides whether it merits investigation. If the facts indicate the commission of a federal offense, he authorizes it. The results are then presented to and reviewed by him. Shall it be presented to a grand jury? He and he alone decides. A bill and indictment must be drawn. Mr. District Attorney does it. Upon his wisdom and experience depends the success or failure of the defendant's efforts to attack the indictment. He sets the case for trial. He presents the government's testimony. He must judge whether or not the government should dismiss any defendant from a given case. He must argue the facts to the jury. He may object to agree to motions for new trial. He often makes recommendations to the trial judge as to the propriety of suspended sentences or the degree of punishment to be meted out. Pleas for probation or commutation of sentences are presented to him. Truly, the accused finds himself in the strong grip of Mr. District Attorney from the inception of the complaint to its final determination. Convictions are obtained in approximately 90% of the criminal cases brought in the federal courts. Truly a phenomenal record, and yet Mr. District Attorney is forever inspired, not only by the desire to convict guilty persons, but by the greater duty to be just. The conviction record is not particularly important, for there is inscribed on the wall of the Department of Justice here in Washington, a motto which is a rule and guide of the federal district attorneys. United States wins its point whenever justice is done its citizens in the courts. As one of the outstanding illustrations of ferreting out the truth is that of a former state district attorney, a former attorney general of the United States, Honorable Homer Cummins in the case of State of Massachusetts versus Israel. Here a poor Jewish itinerant stood charged with murder. All circumstances pointed to his guilt. A confession was obtained. Witnesses identified him as a murderer. Public sentiment ran high. And yet that Mr. District Attorney applied the rule of reason and devotion to duty. He found and demonstrated the innocence of that man and moved his acquittal to the court. As has been said, no finer example of adherence to highest public duty, of patient investigation, of steady and unbending courage, and of quiet disregard of clamor and prejudice can be found. So upon these principles, the laws of our states and our nation are administered. Upon this far-flung front, the Department of Justice of the United States cooperates with the representatives of the states, and the people of America find in the front line of law enforcement that gentleman whom we hail and salute as Mr. District Attorney. And now Mr. William J. Campbell, District Attorney for Northern Illinois, will speak from Chicago. Leading authorities on youth training will speak on the danger to the nation's youth from rackets and racketeering. I have been asked to speak on the general topic of saving America from the racketeers. I am pleased to speak on this subject, particularly from the city of Chicago, where in the last several years we have seen racketeering largely eliminated. Vigorous enforcement of the law, high police standards, and general public cooperation have put racketeers on the run in this city, where once, unfortunately, they so arrogantly held sway. There still, however, remains much to be done, not only here, but over the entire country. And the real problem now is to save our sons and daughters, for after all, are not they the America of tomorrow? In my opinion, the nation's number one problem is the juvenile delinquent. The young boys and girls who take as their hero gunman or racketeer and follow in his footsteps. Last year, more than a half million boys and girls under 21 years of age were arrested and charged with criminal offenses. 
Every swaggering, would-be tough gangster is a hero to innumerable boys who, whose misguided efforts toward adventure lead them to emulate him and thus further add to our prison population. Of course, as public officials, we see only the result of delinquency. Its early beginnings are frequently detectable only within the home environment, where unfortunately all too often transgressions against authority are condoned or actually encouraged, and where admiration for criminals is frequently expressed. If we are to reduce juvenile delinquency, we must approach the problem from altogether different angles than those used with adult offenders. Steps in recognition of this distinction between juvenile and adult offenders were taken by Congress when it passed the Federal Juvenile Delinquency Act in June of last year. This act provides that any person under 17 years of age who commits a crime against the United States, other than those punishable by death or life imprisonment, shall be charged only with juvenile delinquency and not with a specific crime. The law further provides for the segregation of juveniles confined in jails or prisons and for their probation to any public or private social agency designated by the Attorney General of the United States. Prior to the enactment of this legislation, youthful offenders against federal laws were treated with the same severity as adult criminals because there existed no other legal machinery for handling them. In my opinion, the enactment of this law has been one of the most progressive steps ever taken in meeting the growing problem of juvenile delinquency, and it is my intention to see that the spirit of the Federal Delinquency Act is carried out in the Northern District of Illinois. Both as district attorney and as a private citizen, it seems more sensible and more humane to me to achieve the proper guidance of youthful offenders and their probable reformation than to jam the prisons with boys who on release will become accomplished criminals. Certainly the nation will be richer for the boys and girls who might have been lifelong criminals but were turned back into useful citizenship before it was quite too late. America has not begun to solve its crime problem until it has solved the problem of the youthful delinquent. For every gangster sent to the penitentiary, there are a dozen boys ready and willing to replace him in the underworld. To remove for youthful minds the glamour of crime to show crime and criminals in their ugly and cowardly reality, meriting just and proper punishment is the only practical way of combating juvenile delinquency. Only by teaching and by good example in the home and by vigorous, honest, and fearless enforcement of the law will this be accomplished. Next we hear from Mr. Emrick B. Freed, United States District Attorney at Cleveland. I'm glad to join with other district attorneys in this national broadcast and discuss the question of combating crime and the criminal. When people fully realize the annual toll of crime on members of society due to the depredation of criminals and the problem faced by the nation's law enforcement agencies, including the various district attorneys, both state and federal, in combating the criminal, they must of necessity pause and seriously think in what way they can be helpful to the district attorney in his efforts. The short time allotted to each one of us, of course, prevents a lengthy and comprehensive discussion of this question. So I must content myself with but a few remarks. If actual figures could be compiled, I'm convinced they would show fabulous sums amounting to millions taken by confidence men the country over in various types of rackets and swindles from the unsuspecting public who fall as their prey. I say if they could be compiled because of the very often present explanation that many people because of personal embarrassment, are prone to conceal the fact that they were sufficiently gullible to be fleeced by confidence men. Will you permit an illustration from my own experience? An impressive appearing man of about 60, partly blind, rented a sumptuous residence in one of the good hotels in Cleveland and furnished a suite of offices in a large office building hired a secretary, an accomplice, 
where he styled himself an investment counselor. Aided by his rather impressive appearance and cultured behavior, he ingratiated himself through social contacts with a large number of wealthy women whom he entertained lavishly at teas and suppers in large groups. He would there boast of the money he succeeded in making on his stock market operations. He suggested that for a small commission, he would, as a favor to them, invest their money. A number entrusted about $250,000 to the investment counselor to be used in such stock market operations. From time to time, he would write or telephone to them, claiming in 30 days he doubled their money, but would increase their profits further. As a matter of fact, he pocketed all of it and soon disappeared from Cleveland only to repeat his operations in the same manner using the same system in Boston. One of the victims informed the authorities, not giving her name at first, and when he was finally arrested, my telephone was busy with requests from people who we did not even know gave him large sums saying, please do not use my name. I don't want to testify against him. I would be terribly em embarrassed if it were known. These people little realized that their unconcern, by their unconcern, they were helping the swindler to carry on and subject a lot of others to become victimized. We finally succeeded, and he was convicted and sentenced. This is just one example where public cooperation aids the district attorneys. You must assume your obligation to take your place in this social system, if not for the benefit of others, for your own benefit. Personal embarrassment or inconvenience is a small price to be paid for the ultimate objective to be attained. It is worth serious consideration on your part. The next speaker is District Attorney John A. Carroll of Denver, Colorado. Every thinking citizen is taking an active interest in the proper enforcement of the criminal law. This has been demonstrated in the past few years by the splendid support given law enforcement officials of both the state and nation. Not long ago, organized mobs terrorized the nation, and the people actually quaked in their boots after reading and witnessing the bold and brazen effrontery of gangster chieftains. During this period of time, the overlords of the underworld extended their power to such an extent that they seriously threatened to violate and destroy those principles of democracy which are the life's blood of this nation and vital to the happiness and security of our people. It was then that organized crime and vice attempted to take over the reins of local and state government. Through racketeering and huge criminal syndicates, their sphere of influence was extended into the field of politics. And with unlimited financial resources, these highly organized minorities began in certain sections of the country to subjugate law enforcing agencies to their evil will. There, following the slimy trail of official corruption, began the intimidation of witnesses, the tampering with and the threatening of jurors. Personal and political coercion and corruption of those charged with the duty of enforcing laws. Honest and conscientious officials, of whom there were many, were rendered powerless, for public opinion had not yet recognized the stranger within its fold, nor realized the scope of rackets and racketeering. The situation became so desperate that President Roosevelt directed Attorney General Homer Cummings to summon the leading thinkers of the nation into conference to determine methods of waging war on these destructive criminal forces. We all remember the fight of the federal government cooperating with the state governments to rid the country of the mobs and mob leaders, of the splendid work accomplished 
by these various agencies in rendering swift and inevitable capture and punishment to the criminals and racketeers. Believe me when I say to you, this could not have been accomplished unless the people themselves have the courage and the desire to enforce the criminal statutes. We are not here talking of unorganized crime, which is a symptom of social disorder. That is, those crimes resulting from mental disorder, poverty, destitution, broken homes, improper home, moral, and religious training. Rather, are we discussing those crimes which are born of avarice, greed, and the desire for power, led by criminals of intelligence and a capacity for organization. These are the criminals and the type of crime which strike at the very heart of our government. So then, it is for you, the public, to be vigilant, considering it, it your personal duty to support those officials who are charged with protecting you. We go to the Pacific Coast to hear District Attorney Matthew Brady of San Francisco. The rising tide of crime in America is a national menace, despite the ever-widening diffusion of knowledge, spread of educational facilities, adoption of human... ...and wherein the trouble lies, to discover the causes of crime, how to eradicate them, how to deal with the lawbreaker, how to provide for post-penitentiary conditions. In my opinion, however, neither changes in judicial procedure, reforms in the laws, the adoption of new rules, nor the creation of any new or novel legal machinery will wholly solve the problem. The difficulties go farther and reach deeper. It is largely a question of public psychology, or to put it otherwise, the attitude of the people toward law itself. This means not merely the people's attitude concerning the written statute, but their attitude toward their enforcement officials and toward their duty in the matter of cooperating diligently, whether as a moral supporter, a witness, or a juror. The remedy for lawlessness is not more laws. The remedy lies rather in scientific legislation founded upon correct principles and in the development of right attitudes of the governed toward law as such. The corrective process will not be one merely of measures, but should be addressed to the state of the public mind and to the arousing and welding together of a public conscience that will tolerate only such laws as meet with the approval of the free majority and put behind those laws the force of widespread, organized public opinion. The district attorney, with the hearty approval and cooperation of the people, should be encouraged to insist that crime be taken out of the realm of emotion and handled in the field we call science. In other words, to bring about a better observance of the law, there should be conducted an energetic, earnest, and noble campaign for a better understanding of the causes, the treatment, and the prevention of crime. The real purpose of this campaign should be to better protect society. Sob sisters and hard-boiled public officials have no place in this work. The solution of the crime problem challenges the understanding of scientists and specialists. It must be borne in mind, however, that until we can intelligently and scientifically pity those who transgress, it is better to treat them for what they are, enemies to society. A just, speedy, and certain administration of the law is man's best bulwark against a relapse into a state of savagery. You, the people, can have any kind of government you demand. Your desire for an intelligent administration of justice can be obtained by a better understanding between you and your district attorney. And now from Los Angeles, we hear District Attorney Buron Fitz. 
The protection of life and property is the first and primary object of every civilized government. No matter what happiness or prosperity flows from its operations, unless this obligation is firmly and fully met, government has been a complete failure. A former president of the United States recently said, America is the most lawless civilized nation on earth. This indictment of our country would not have been necessary or true except insofar as the apathy and the indifference of our citizens to the problem of crime has made it both necessary and true. Crime without exception, both in cost and effect, is the greatest single liability the American people carry. Crime is not a disease. Crime is a business. Criminals are engaged in murder, theft, robbery, and burglary, not because they are sick mentally, but solely for financial reasons. Therefore, crime in its operation is a direct conflict between the law-abiding, decent citizens on the one hand and the criminal on the other. It is an actual state of warfare, armed warfare, between these two groups. We now know that in every large center of population throughout the United States, that crime is organized. It has been estimated that the crime population of this country numbers only one-third of one percent of all the American people. Murder takes each year in human life approximately one-half the number of American soldiers killed during the World War. At the rate of nearly a million dollars an hour, the crime cost to the people of America exceeds that of the cost of the World War for the same period. No sane American bleeds for one moment that we can or will stop crime. But every decent American hopes for that time when we will have succeeded in reducing this problem to a minimum. And it is to that end that the thoughtful attention of America and its citizens is now being directed. The police agencies, prosecutors, and courts are the established forces of government created by our people with which to combat crime. But there is another division in our warfare against the criminal that is well nigh forgotten by our people, and that is the jury impaneled to try the accused. Under our system of government, it is not the police officer, the prosecutor, or even the judge, except in rare instances, that can determine guilt or innocence. This all-important phase lies exclusively within the province of the jury itself. Juries are drawn from the public, and therefore when the former president of this country saw fit to indict the nation on the prevalence of crime, he went on further to say that this awful indictment would not either be necessary or true if during the past American juries had without fear or favor done their full and complete duty. We are making national progress in our war against crime. Organized gangs are being broken up and its members convicted. Rackets and racketeers are being dispersed and their perpetrators imprisoned. Our people are crime conscious and they are demanding as never before in our history that their lives, their children, and their property be protected as against the criminal. Therein lies our hope. Absolute, honest, ruggedly honest observance of their oath of office on the part of the public service coupled with unflinching intelligence support on the part of our people, will win ultimately. From coast to coast, district attorneys of leading American cities have spoken. They all urge cooperation and help from you, the public, in fighting crime and rackets. This program was arranged by NBC as a preview to its new dramatic serial entitled Mr. District Attorney, which starts over many of these stations tomorrow, Monday, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget to tune in. This is the National Broadcasting Company.